Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to the program. Today, instead of working on the compiler for the Yacht programming language, I thought it would be fun to take the language for a spin and try to build something with it. Uh, it's three and a half weeks old at this point, and I thought we would try to make a JSON parser and try to sort of create something similar to the JSON value and JSON parser stuff in Serenity OS. Um, and I'm sure that we're going to run into trouble and missing language features and stuff like that. But it's important that we exercise the language regularly so we can discover these pain points. And um, also, of course, learn to learn how to use Yakt in general. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to basically implement a JSON parser based on the one we have in C++ today. And then see how that goes. So um, the way you use our C++ parser is something like, um, let me go somewhere. You might do something like, say that you have a string that has some input, and maybe it has your JSON object in here. Uh, I don't know, something like that. Uh, you can then pass that to JSON value from string, I think it is. And then it gives you back a parsed JSON object tree. Um, and we're going to make some kind of similar API. Uh, da -da. So the um, core thing in the existing JSON implementation is we have this JSON value class, which has a bunch of subtypes. So these are the, um, the various JSON subtypes, like null, uh, boolean, string, array, object, and number. And actually, in Serenity OS right now, number is split across a bunch of more specific numeric types. But I think let's make it easy for ourselves right now in our implementation and just use like a single number representation. So we're going to start by just declaring an enum, which will be our JSON value. And then we're going to have null, uh, what did we call him? Bool string array object. Oh, and we don't need any uh, commas at the end here. And I must not forget about number. Okay. And then we are going to have some kind of, I guess we'll make a main function. And let's say um, that we have our input. We're just going to hard code it for now. So how about we make some basic stuff like, like I was just doing there, uh, maybe foo um, as the string bar. Something like that. OK. So what the parsing this should produce is, or actually, let's change that to a number. Uh, what parsing this should produce is a JSON value object, this container right here. And then it should have uh, one key, the foo key, which points to a JSON value number of 1, 2, 3. So we have to. Um, declare what type of data is stored in these things. So this thing right here, um, for simplicity, let's just use an i64 right now. So it's a 64-bit integer. I think uh, what we should probably really be using is a double precision floating point uh, number, but we don't have floating point support. It's not very strong in Yacht yet. So we'll just do um, basic integer. This thing needs a bool. And this thing needs a string. And let's see. I wonder if these are, these might clash with um, the built-in types in Yacht. So Yacht has a string, has an array. And it's entirely possible that we're going to run into some weirdness uh, because we are using sort of um, built-in type names. But we'll find out. An object is going to be a... Actually, this is not going to be an array. This is going to be um, it's going to be an array of JSON value, and object is going to be a dictionary of string to JSON value. Okay. So, 
at this point, let's just see if even this compiles. Because if this compiles, we will at least know that we have a data structure that it can tolerate. OK, it didn't like that. Um, incomplete type string. Yeah, so this calling it string is probably not going to fly at this moment. So we'll just call it JSON string. And also, we'll have to call this JSON array. Yeah, so already we have a little issue here that we can't call these enum values the same name. Even though they're scoped, we can't call them that. So I'll put it fix me right here, JSON string, and or why not put it closer? Fix me. Uh, this variant should be called string. Uh, and array. Also, my uh, <laughs> my comments are not correctly syntax highlighted, so it seems like something is maybe wrong with the um, with the syntax highlighter thingy. So let me just rebuild that package. Okay. Oops. And did that work? I can't tell. All right, I'm just going to restart VS Code. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know why that doesn't work. Is that because we're inside of an enum, maybe? Because the comments work outside. OK, so there's a bug for, <laughs> for the syntax highlighting stuff. Anyway, OK, fix me syntax highlighting. I'll put that right here. Syntax highlighting should understand inline comments in enum. OK, all right, now it builds great. So actually, maybe I'll put that up here. So what are we going to do next? I guess we are going to parse the input. So we want to declare a parse helper function, which is going to look something like uh, parse JSON. And it will take an input string. Maybe we'll call it source. And let's make it anonymous. Anonymous just means that when you call it, uh, if you call parse JSON, then if it's not anonymous, you have to say source like this. Uh, but if we make it anonymous, then it's OK for you to omit that. Um, but in many cases, it kind of makes sense to have these labels. But there are situations where it's just obvious from context. So that's why we have anonymous parameters. Um, anyway, what does this return? It returns a JSON value, um, but it could also fail, in which case we will throw an error. OK. And then we will say that um, ba -ba -ba, value is parse JSON. OK. And then let's, I guess, print out the result if this works out. So we'll do that. And just to verify that all of this stuff works, let's try returning an old JSON value. And let's see. OK, prints out JSON value null. So far, so good. All right. so. Now we are going to sneak a peek over at the JSON parser we have in Serenity and see how that works. Because I guess the whole idea with this language is to make it easy for ourselves to bring all of our C++ and Serenity uh, over into Yacht to get memory safety and um, a lot of er like ergonomic features and stuff like that. So 
this is just really going to be the workflow for the foreseeable future, uh, for myself at least, if we succeed with this Yacht experiment, uh, because then we'll have a lot of C++ to bring over. So I guess I'm just going to try to do the same thing here. Um, or in other words, I'm just going to try to port the existing C++ parser and see how that goes. So where is the entry point exactly? Is it parse? Okay, JSON parser parse. Why is this in a class? I guess we could put this in a class. I guess maybe it's using some of the generic lexer functionality, which, um, well, we don't have generic lexer in Yacht, so we're just gonna have to do stuff ourselves, but this general structure seems kind of reasonable, so maybe we should bring that over. We can very easily do that. So we will copy the class over, but not inherit anything. And uh, we don't need that constructor. Uh, we do need to have a public function parse, which um, takes the input. What was it called? Oh, wait, it was called nothing. Oh, right, 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 because the um, input is a member. So let's see. Uh, private, no, it's private by default. Um, Input string, okay. JSON value may throw, okay. Here we go. And all of these return error or JSON values, so that's really simple. Then we can just do a little bit of multi line editing right here. Uh, let's see, oh wait, one of them had a semicolon there. Okay, here we go. Throws or JSON value. All right, so far so good. And of course this thing, consume and unescape string, whatever that is, um, either throws or returns a string. So here we go. So then the API for parse JSON would probably be something like let mutable parser is uh, JSON parser input source. Okay, well, maybe source was a silly name for that. We can just call it input. And that actually allows me to demonstrate that if you are passing something to a uh, parameter named input and you have it in a variable named input locally, you don't need to specify the um, parameter name. And um, now that we have symmetrical parameter names here, this didn't need to be anonymous either because you can just omit that. So maybe that's pretty nice. Anyway, um, let's see. So we create the parser and then we are going to return parser parse. I think that'll be it, yeah. Okay, so what does this thing do? Um, I assume it has some sort of a cursor. Yeah, the generic lexer which we inherit from has a cursor, so we're gonna need to have a cursor as well. Uh, we'll just call that, I don't know, cursor. And we will have to initialize that down here. So we just say cursor starts at zero. Okay. And then the parse function calls parse helper and then ignores white space and then verifies that we are indeed at the end of the file. Uh, and then it returns the result. Okay, so for whatever reason, we are swallowing white space at the end of the input. I'm sure there's some some reason for that. Okay, so let's see. I guess this is the easy way to, to implement this for now. So parse helper is the workhorse. And then uh, we'll put fix me here, ignore white space, um, serenity 
ack json parser ignores white space trailing white space for some reason yeah Valley. We can also check for e off actually. So if we're not at the end of the file, so I guess we can make a little helper for that. Um, we'll call it e off. Uh, returns a bool and it tells us if the cursor is at the end of the input. So if cursor is um, at the end or past the end. Okay, so if we are not at the off at this point, so not at the off, um, then we want to return an error. Didn't consume all input. Okay, so here, now we want to throw an error, and now we run into kind of a missing feature in the language. So the only type of error we can generate right now is um, an error no error, so like, the one you typically get from from like standard C library APIs. Um, so this should really be like some cool error code, but instead we are just going to put uh, nine thousand <laughs> for some reason, and then um, I guess we can annotate here what the error should actually say as a comment. Uh, da -da, fix me. Yeah, so this is what the error should say. But we don't have that right now. So uh, we'll just we'll just make these error no errors and uh, once we have a way to to create more interesting errors then we will have to come and fix this up. Oh, and I'm now realizing that these functions here are uh, they're supposed to be instance methods, so we have to say that they operate on a this, and it's, they're operating on a mutable this because they can actually uh, advance the cursor, which is a mutating operation. So I think all of these are going to have to take a mutable this. If you don't pass any kind of this, that means that um, it's a static function, so it, it you can you don't require an object instance to call it on. Um, but eof right here does not actually alter or mutate any state, so it doesn't require a mutable this. That's why it takes this like this. Okay. So let's see what parse helper does. Okay, well, this looks really nice and simple. So we ignore while uh, it's white space, and then we take a peek at the upcoming character, and then we switch on that. Um, have a bunch of interesting cases here, and if it's none of them, then we fail with an error. Okay, so that's what parse helper is going to do. So we're going to, what was the first thing? Ignore white space. So I guess maybe we should just have a helper for that, like ignore, skip white space, let's call it. Okay, so let's make a little helper for that. Skip white space. Mutable this doesn't need to return anything, uh, and it just needs to peek at the next character. If it's a white space, then advance the cursor. So, if input at index, or wait, hold on, um, while not e off. If input at index is not. Um, white space, so I guess we can, oh, what counts as white space is space. Okay, it's so one of these characters, got it. Um, well, I guess we can make a helper for that. Or do we need a helper? I don't know, I'm gonna make a helper. Function is white space. Uh, da, 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 da. And what is what is this going to be? It's going to be a C 
char, I guess. So let's see, return match C. So if it's a tab, match, oh no, not match, return. Okay. So this would be a little clunky because we can't, uh, I think we can't combine multiple um, patterns here. So we're gonna have to do one match for each possible value. But I think that will be okay. Let's see, does this still compile? It does not. Line 45. Oh, right, because I'm still here. So if not is white space input at index, then we'll break. Otherwise, we will advance the index. Okay, and then we had something at line 86. Oh, we have a semicolon right there. Um, unknown function size on the input. Oh, input is a string. So I guess that is a, has a length. Strings have length. There we go. Okay, we're, we're getting somewhere. Let value is parse helper. Okay, so we have to, parse helper is an instance method, so we have to call it on this. So we just use the dot shorthand. Okay, unknown member of struct json parser dot index. Yes, because it was not index, it was cursor. I actually like index better, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna replace that. Index, okay. Index used on value that can't be indexed. Hmm. Oh, strings are not indexable. That's fair. Um, shoot. So, I guess for this, let's just add ourselves a um, some kind of accessor so we can access an individual character of a string. But, because um, I, I didn't add um, like a UTF-8 iterator or anything like that yet, but I need to add one, but right now we don't have anything like that. So let's just add a little helper. Um, we'll call it like, I don't know, byte at. And it will give you back a, a U8, I suppose, would be okay. Which means that we're gonna be dealing with U8s rather than Cchars, but that's okay. We just have to use byte literals here. Okay. And then let's make sure that we actually implement that byte add function in our string class in the C++ runtime library. So that would be something like, u8 byte add, size ti. Yeah, there we go. Use some value that can't be indexed. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Because I'm gonna call byte at. Aha. Okay, and now we have a bunch of uh, functions that uh, reach the end of non-void functions. So we have to actually return something from these things. So for now, let's just uh, return JSON value null from all of these. It'll be nice and simple. I just want to get to the point where this compiles. Parse helper, okay. Oops. 
parser.parse. All right, there we go. So error code 9000. It builds and runs, fantastic. I don't remember what 9000 was that we didn't get to E off, I guess. Yeah. Okay, fine. So now we have, I think we have all the primitives we need. So we can go and do that parse helper thing. Parse helper. Okay, so skip the white space. And next step was to peek one character, as I recall. Parse helper. Peek one character and then switch on it. So, well, I'm going to have a peek function and then we'll match on that. So that takes a non mutable this and. It's gonna give you back, let's let's make it simple and just give you back a U8. And if we are at E off for whatever reason, I will just return um zero. Um and then you know maybe in the future we would return um like an optional U8 here, but I think right now um I know that matching on optional is a bit iffy, so Let's just go ahead and um, use a zero as an EOF marker. So we're taking some shortcuts, but um, in general, we should be able to, to do this, I think. Let's see. So peaking means that we simply return input byte at current index. OK. And then we want to match on that. So we'll check for left curly and in that case we want to let's see wait all of these branches return something okay so then we can return match okay so this one is parse object then we had a whole bunch of other ones like open bracket which is parse array uh, we had double quote, which is parse string. Then, oh, this is kind of awkward. <laughs> I guess we, we kind of have to do something similar here, maybe even more disgusting, actually, because um, I can't make like a, a byte range or anything like that. Oh, speaking of bytes, I have to specify that these are byte literals. Uh, parse number. Okay, yeah. And then we're just going to make a bunch of these and do this. Obvious room for improvement here. But let's power forward. Okay, and then we have F and T, which start the strings false and true, respectively. Parse false, parse true, and parse null, I believe. That's how we're set up. And in the else case, the else case, we're supposed to actually return an error. So we want to throw in the else case. Um, so our match expression is a little bit um, a little bit finicky because if you're using, um, if you are pointing directly at an expression like this, then match acts as an expression. But if you, you can also open up a block, but once you have a block, um, match sort of, sort of stops being an expression. So then you can't return it anymore. You will have to return in here instead. And this is definitely, this is not the final state of the language. It's just uh, sort of where the compiler is right now. Um, and it's one of many things that we need to figure out. But right now, let's see. So my thinking is I need to have a way to fail down here. I guess I can make a parse um, failure or whatever, and then 
it will just fail with unexpected character as the error. So I'll do something like this. Okay. Um, I mean, this seems okay. So parse failure. Throws purportedly returns JSON value, but never actually does because uh, error, let's say, or message. That's a 9001. <laughs> okay, will this compile? Not quite. Reaches end of non void function. Okay, so uh, here's another problem with the compiler that uh, it can't tell that there's no, no way past this point right here. So we have to put a return. So I'll put fix me. The compiler should notice that we can't get here and allow omitting the return. Okay, that compiles, good. So um, with our test input, we are inputting uh, curly. So let's try to parse object, I guess that would be our first destination. So what does Serenity's parser do for object? Okay, so we consume, I guess, meaning that we expect the current character to be this, and then we advance the cursor. So let's type something similar here. So um, if not consume specific um, left curly, then throw error from error no. Fix me, and then the error should actually say expected curly. Yeah, so I'm just going to put that in here. Also, I was supposed to, I forgot to um, put the error message here, unexpected character. Yeah, that's what this one should say. Or, well, it says here, actually. OK. Uh, da, 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 parse object. Okay, and then we make a loop. We skip white space. Okay, so we can do these things. We'll make an infinite loop, skip white space. And if we encounter a right curly, then we break out of the loop. Okay, so if peak is right curly. Also, I, I guess I need to. I need to switch to byte literals everywhere, I think. We'll see. Consume specific is not implemented. Yeah, of course, of course. So let's implement consume specific. Consume specific is going to be mutable this because we can advance the cursor. Uh, and then it takes an expected character, which is anonymous because let's say that it's implied from context. And it will return Boolean if it consumes and uh, true if it consumes, false if it does not consume. So um, if peak is not expected, return false. Otherwise, index plus plus return true. Okay. Consume specific. So that compiles. I wonder if I need to say that these are byte literals actually. Yes, I do. Okay, yeah. See, if you don't use the correct literal type, then it will complain because you're comparing assigned and unsigned. Uh, types, which is good, I think. Yuct is much, much stricter than C++ about um, 
like automatic type conversions. Like we don't we don't do automatic type conversions unless they are um, like provably safe at compile time. Anything that could fail at runtime, we refuse to do. Uh, bum, bum. Okay, so now I guess it ran and got into a loop. That makes sense because we uh, we're in an infinite loop here. So what's the next step? Ignore more white space and then consume a consume and unescape string. Sure. Um, this makes me think that the it's kind of weird that the Serenity JSON parser doesn't lex into tokens. It just sort of goes on a character by character basis. But I guess that's okay. It just means that you have to sort of explicitly deal with white space in a bunch of places. Uh, okay, so n not not auto. Let name is consume and unscape string followed by if oh if the name is null expected object property name. I don't know how that could happen. Does this thing ever return an old string? I don't think it does. Yeah, that's probably overly paranoid code in Serenity parser. Um, one one big difference, by the way, between the Serenity and Yacht already is that in Serenity, strings can be null. Like all strings have an, an built-in null state. And in Yacht, we're getting rid of that. So there's no such thing as a null string. If you want to have uh, the absence of a string, you have to represent that as an optional string. So um, there isn't like an uh, uh, there's the empty string, which is a zero length string. But if you want to have a string that can be absolutely nothing, then that's an optional string. Um, these two are equivalent. Anyway. So consume and unescape string. And then, yeah, I think that's nonsense. Skip more white space. And then consume a colon. OK. So same basic idea as up here. Just getting a colon. Okay, and then skip more white space. And then now we're on the right side of the colon, so then we call parse helper to parse whatever comes up next. Sure. Parse helper. Um, okay, and then we put this into a JSON object that we're building up. All right, right, right. So. This function actually needs to uh, make some kind of a dictionary that we can store things into. So let's just make one. So we'll make one like, wait, 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 that's not how we do that. That way? Does that compile? Mm, expected initializer. Oh, wait, I didn't name it. <laughs> um, dictionary, or let's say values. Yeah, there we go. Oh, no, my syntax is right. Yeah. Yeah, so this is um, how you can create a dictionary of um, string to JSON value. Pretty nice. We're trying to um, we're trying to take all of the all of the data structures that we use in Serenity all the time, like vectors, hash maps, strings, um, sets and the various other things and give them sort of dedicated syntax in the language so that it becomes um, easier to work with them and sort of more intuitive, uh, more obvious things. And you don't have to go through all this ceremony of like uh, instantiating a templated class and then calling bunch of functions on it to to create a basic dictionary like instead you just do this so let's see I mean I suppose this still looks a little bit esoteric but um, I think I think I think it's gonna be an improvement um, 
We'll, we'll see over time how it feels. Like, of course, everything we have to evaluate incrementally or as we go. But I have a good feeling about these things. Um, so what do I want to do with this thing? I want to add it to my thing. So I will say values. What did I call it? Name or something, right? Maybe I should call it key instead. So values key is value. Does that? That works, right? And then it warns me about that because I'm ignoring the um, result of this operation. Hmm. Wait, why does it care if I ignored the result of that operation? Dictionary set. Um. Oh, because it can fail. Wait, what? Oh, interesting. Okay, so here's a bug in the compiler that um, because appending something or adding something to a dictionary may need to allocate memory, which means that it can fail because memory allocation, you can run out of memory, so that can fail. So there's an inherent fallibility to the operation of adding something to a dictionary, which means that it's a throwing operation. But right now, um, what we're being warned about here is that the compiler, um, the compiler is telling us, hey, you're calling something that may fail and you're not doing anything with the um, potential error. So um, we need to teach the compiler that um, this sort of access to a dictionary, like using um, bracketed access um, L value to write into a dictionary needs to be treated as a fallible operation. So that's a kind of a bug in the compiler. Um, let's see, I think I can call set key value here. So this is like the kind of syntax that I don't actually want to use, but it gets rid of the warning for now. So I'm just going to put a fix me here. Um, this should say values key is value. Compile, um, compiler doesn't emit, doesn't wrap it in try. Yeah, that's the problem. It needs to be wrapped in try by the um, compiler. Okay, so we're discovering problems as we go. That's very, very good. All right, so now we're adding that thing to the dictionary. And let's take a look at what comes up next. Ignoring more white space. Uh, skip white space, sure. And if the upcoming character is a right curly, that means we are at the end, I guess. So we want to break out of the loop. That's cool. Otherwise, we look for a comma. There has to be a comma, yeah. Uh, so if the next character is not a comma, that means that we have some sort of error, which is supposed to say expected comma, yeah. So fix me expected comma. But again, we don't have a way to throw rich errors, so we'll just throw a cool number. Okay, and then ignore, <laughs> ignore more white space. And finally, look for, oh, look for a right curly again. Oh, so we look for a comma followed by a right curly, which would be um, a bogus input. So if peak is uh, right curly, then that's a bug. So fix me unexpected right curly. Okay. Good, good, good. Still compiled. Now we're getting error 9003. Right, so we're not finding a colon after consuming and unescaping the string. I think that's just because consuming an unes unescaped string is not implemented yet. So we'll get to that. 
So what happens after the loop here in parse object is that we look for a final write curly. Consume specific write curly. Oh, the comma was supposed to be uh, consume specific. Okay. And we need the right curly right here. It's me expected right curly. Cool. And then finally, we return a JSON value object with our dictionary. So that's where we put our values in there. Cool, it compiles. So let's implement consume and unescape string. Let's see what it does actually. Uh, okay, a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know why these are done like this, kind of weird. <laughs> okay, that's a big function. I guess we will just um, start simple. So what is it doing? <laughs> well, first off, we look, we consume a um, opening double quote. So if not consume specific opening double quote, Expected double quote. Okay, and then we want to, let's see, we want to use a string builder to accumulate bytes for a string. I guess that makes sense. Um, okay, so I'm just going to bring in string builder from C++. It's not in the prelude but uh, it's not one of the exposed built-in types, but I can bring it in like this, extra struct string builder. So I'm just gonna bring in the, the Serenity string builder API. Uh, and we have function to string, um, which gives you a string or error. Uh, and then we also need to append characters. So I guess we'll just say append. Um, I think it has one of those. Let's see, string builder append. Um, oh shoot, it has an append, but it takes, um, a C char. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we can lie to it. I'm not sure. Let's see if this falls apart. We'll have to do some conversion. Let's see. Uh, da -da. Consume and unescape string. Okay. So, what did we want to do here? We wanted to. Wait, what are we actually doing here? Peak. So if we peek to the end. We look for any of these characters. Okay. And if we have a code point below hex 20, then that's an invalid string, apparently. Otherwise, we peek ahead, sure. Oh, okay, so we're just um, sort of speeding ahead here until we encounter something that's either a double quote or a backslash. Um, all right. Okay. 
let's see. So let, I guess let's just implement the same logic. So we'll make a string builder. Hmm. Function string builder. It's called final SB here. It's kind of awkward. Kind of an awkward name. Okay, so peak index is current index. And then we're going to scan ahead. So if peak index is greater than or equal to input length, then break. Sure. Otherwise, get the character at the current peak index. Wait, ch. Oh, okay, that goes up there. Uh, so something like that. Okay. And if it's a double quote or a backslash, then we break out. Okay, so if ch is double quote or ch is a backslash, break. And then we were also checking for um, below hex 20. So if ch below hex 20, Next me is ASCII control. C0 control. I guess that's like some special part of the ASCII uh, set. So, okay, error while parsing string. It's not a very imaginative error, but we'll, we'll just preserve that error title for now, or error message. Peak index, okay. Hmm. So is this the same as while peak index less than input index? Is it not input length? Okay. Uh, while peak index is not an index. Okay. Now we're going to append to our famous builder. So let's see how this goes. Byte at index, and then we increment index, right? Yeah. Okay, so here we forgot to say that these are byte literals. Error from error now. Oh, I'm trying to return an error. That doesn't work. You have to throw the error. Makes sense. Yep, yep, yep. Fair enough. Increment decrement of immutable variable. Okay, has to be mutable. Fair enough. Cannot call static method on an instance. Okay, so I didn't declare string builder correctly. I forgot to say that append takes a mutable this. Fair enough. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so I think it's just the compiler isn't uh, the compiler is not going to notice that there's a mismatch here. So in C++, this append function actually takes a signed C char type, but I'm just lying to the Oct compiler and saying, no, 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 the C++ API takes um, a U8, and then um, the C++ just sort of silently converts it, which is ugly, but it works in our favor right now because we, <laughs> we don't have to deal with the 
converting it. Um, fix me. Um, ac string builder append actually takes a um, C char, not a U8. But nobody complains. Yeah, this should, we should probably have some sort of mechanism that stops us from that, but um, we'll, we can leave it like that for now with the fix me. Consume and unescape string. Okay, so we were advancing here until we got to the... Um, And okay, so if we have reached the length of the string, if index is okay, so that's the same as eof. If eof, then break. Sure, that's fair enough. If ch is double quote, break. If ch is not, so the current character that we stopped on is not a backslash then consume it and continue the loop. Okay, so FCH. Final SB, so builder consume. Consume is a new API. We had consume specific, but we never had a consume. So consume, um, it's going to return the character that we are consuming. It takes immutable this because it mutates the cursor or the index. So if eof, hmm, I guess this thing just assumes that, yeah, verify. So we'll panic the program if we're, in, if we're actually at the end. I think that's okay. It would be a logic mistake to call it if you haven't already checked for EOF. So, um, I guess we will peek at the current character, advance the cursor, and return the character. Nice and simple. Okay, so where is that string helper? Um, I wish, I wish that we had like real IDE support. So currently we only have syntax highlighting, but I can't like click on stuff to go to definition. We didn't build a language server yet, but I find myself trying to click on stuff every now and then just thinking that it's going to take me to the, <laughs> to the definition, um, but we'll get one of those things soon enough. So let's see. Right, so consume there and then continue the loop, right? That's what we were doing. And then ignore, I guess, just skips over one character. Let's implement that right quick. Mutable this. Um, yeah, I think that's what it does. checks that you are, oh, it takes an, here it takes a number, which tells you how many steps to ignore. But I think we don't need that for our, for our JSON parser right now. So we're just gonna have a simple API that just skips one step ahead. Okay, so ignore followed by if next is, next is, is that the same as just peaking? Yeah. Okay, so we can express that with peaking. Um, let's see, so if peak is b, double quote, then ignore and builder append, double quote. Right, so what's happened now is that uh, we are handling an escaped character, right? So if the current character was not a backslash, then we've continued the loop already, but now we are handling uh, the backslash. So backslash double quote means to emit a double quote. 
So I think we're just going to deal with the various backslash escapes here. So we'll see what they are. Um, so we have uh, backslash forward slash, which I guess just adds a forward slash. Backslash n, which makes, of course, a new line. And other fun stuff like that. So let's see. Backslash n. Backslash r for a carriage return. T for tab and B for uh, backspace, I guess. T for tab, B for backspace. And who else is this going to be? Like a vertical tab or something? F for form feed. OK. So T, B, and F. T, B, F. To be fair. T, B. I don't know if the uh, Yacht compiler is going to swallow all of these. Oh, and then we have Unicode literals. OK, so I'm going to just go ahead and say that Unicode literals are a little bit of a fix me for now. So. Um, Or no, let's say uh, abort. Fix me, implement Unicode literals. Um, and then I have to also, of course, declare the external abort function. OK. And then where was I comparing against the double quote? Here. Wrong number of arguments to ignore. Oh, interesting. Because I'm not calling it on the instance, then it says wrong number of arguments. That's a kind of a bad error. Actually, we should we should have a better error for that. Like if you're trying to call ignore um, without calling it on an instance, we should say, hey, you need an instance to call this or whatever. Hmm. OK, so it seems like that compiles. But the, the C++ compiler is complaining about um, like too many parentheses. But that's OK. The code is still correct. So I think I'm going to turn off that warning in the uh, compiler driver so we don't have to look at it. Uh, let's see. Sometimes our generated C++ is has a lot of parentheses. Yeah, let's just say something like that. Um, oh wait, did I not do that right? Oh, I'm supposed to say W. No, of course, of course. Here we go. OK, so far so good. And then what are the final steps of this thing when you consume the string? So we skipped over the Unicode literal part because I don't have um, like hexadecimal conversion and stuff like that anyway. And then here we want to throw if we get to the end. So throw error from error no. What number was I even on? 9009. Error while parsing string. Again, kind of a crappy error, but we will just preserve those verbatim. OK, so we exit the loop here, and we say, if not, consume specific double quote. Then that's also an error, because we expected a double quote. OK. Cool enough. And finally, we want to return the builder to string. Nine thousand seven. Finally, a new error. OK. Consume an unescape string. If not consume, double quote. Oh, great. We're failing there. 
Um, I wonder if that's the first key or the second key. Let's print out what we got here. Print ln key. Okay, so it does print out the key. Foo, which means that we are probably struggling with the second value or the, um, the value that follows. Which means that we would be after the colon. So we expected a colon, skip by space, call parse helper once again. Okay, and then that will call into parse number because we have, if you recall, it says one, two, three down here. Uh, wait, how do I get to parse number? Okay. Okay, and this thing does a bunch of stuff to handle uh, fractions and floating point uh, stuff. So we are going to be um, a little bit lazy here and only handle integers, of course, as I was saying. So let's say if, um, let's say let mutable is negative, it's going to be false and then, or no, it can actually be peak equal to minus because if we we currently have the, the index cursor pointing at the first character of the number, right? So if that is a minus, then we will um, then we're good. Although I also want to advance the um, cursor in that case. So that's kind of irritating. Okay, uh, is negative. We'll say false and then if peak okay yeah this is this is like a little bit clumsy negative is true and advance index plus plus so in a situation like this it might be nice if you didn't have to declare is negative is mutable but instead you could actually use if as an expression right so you would be able to do something more like this um, So this is what Rust lets you do something like that. It actually also looks super awkward. So I don't know. I mean, that's not better. The, the one advantage of this approach is that now your is negative local is immutable, which is neat. Um, hmm. Yeah, but it still looks kind of goofy. Okay, let's just roll with this for now. So here we are going to do that, and then we're going to accumulate into um, into this thing. We don't have to say that actually, that's the default. Okay, and then, um, hmm. Well, this is the part where we parse a base 10 number, I guess. <laughs> Or let's, we're supposed to support hexadecimal and octal as well, are we? Maybe? I don't know, whatever JavaScript supports. I'm sure we're supposed to su we need to support hex. But, wait. Don't you have to support hex? Am I? Did I dream that parse number? JSON hexadecimal. Oh, explicitly does not support octal or hexadecimal. Huh. All right. Well, fair enough. Shows shows how much I know. Um, okay, so then we only need to deal with base ten. So I guess we will just keep going while the current character is, um, we, let's see, while not at the end, if peak, or we can do a match peak actually. Um, 
let's see if peak is, let's see h is peak okay if ch is greater than and ch okay so it's an hexadecimal digit or not a hexadecimal it's an it's a ascii digit uh, then value um, see the value that we have is multiplied by 10 right and then we also add ch minus is this how you do it i haven't done this in forever <laughs> uh, and if it's not one of those then we break let's say Hmm. I guess you can also write this in the early break way. So um, either this way. Oh, that looks fair enough. So this part is going to be like a little bit of a deviation from the um, from the Serenity version. Okay, assignment between incompatible types. Okay, so here's our first typecast that we need to do. Interesting. So we need to turn this right here into a i64, and we know that that's fine. So we can just do an unconditional conversion and we also have so this is an infallible conversion which means that if for any reason it would fail we would uh, panic the program at that point but we know that this is fine um, so we can use an exclamation point as if you do this instead it gives you back um, so it gives you back an optional instead of an i64 so you get an i64 um, question mark and if the number you were trying to convert is not representable as an i64 you get an empty or none optional in that case but here we can just do a um, unconditional fallible infallible conversion um, and then we get 9006 which means that we didn't find our closing curly interesting so this is at the end of parse object Okay, so let's just log what we are finding instead because I'm curious. I found, I guess, this instead of right curly. Peak. What is there? Um, oh, wait. I'm not looking in the right place. <laughs> it was 9006, not the, not the right one. Here we are. Found zero. Oh, shoot. Is that E off? Did we get to E off? I guess we got to E off here. Okay, so when we were consuming that number value, we just kept going as long as there were digits. Parse number. <laughs> so let's see. We would break here. Okay, so let's see. Print ln returning parsed number. Let's say like that just to find out what we're getting. Parse number one, two, three. Seems all good. Sure. And what were we doing in the object? We had. Da, da, da. So we called parse helper to parse the value. Sure. Insert it into the thing, and then skip white, white space and look for a um, right curly. So there should be no white space after after the value. There should be just a right curly. So let's find out what's going on. Let's see where we what we have after parsing the value here. After value, let's print it as a character.
Okay, so there's a right curly. And after value and white space. Okay, so we should be breaking here, right? Break a -roo. We are breaking there. Good. So we'll break out of that loop. End up down here. Oh, and it should say if not consume specific, right? If that fails. Same thing with this one, if not consume specific. Okay, I'm not using those right. Yeah, I was missing the not. And there we go. It totally parsed a JSON object. Um, and uh, in Yuct, all, um, all the structs and enums and classes and stuff um, are automatically serializable, so you don't need to write serialization code yourself. And you can just pass them to print line, uh, like we're doing here. So passing a the result of a JSON parse to print line gives you this type of output. And here you can actually see that this is a JSON value enum of a variant object, and it has this array inside of it. Or no, it's a dictionary. Actually, it has this dictionary uh, with the key foo pointing at value number one, two, three. So let's try to extend. Uh, put a little new line in here, a little comma, put a little bar, uh, and maybe put a four, five, six over there. Wouldn't that be cool? And look at that. It parses correctly. Pretty cool. Oof. Okay, so... We haven't implemented, obviously, we haven't done the whole JSON parser, but we have the the start of one. And I think we're going to wrap it up here for today, because um, I guess we, we got to the point where we could run with our test input. And uh, this was really fun, really educational, and I hope that I was able to give you sort of an idea of where the language is right now. Uh, we definitely stepped in some little problems, and we tried to avoid stepping into <laughs> some problems. But uh, uh, as you, for, for a language that's like three and a half weeks old, I think this is pretty pretty decent already. Like we can clearly express ourselves. It's just um, some things are a little bit clumsy and need more polish. But I'm really really uh, happy with the direction things are going and the pace. And I feel really good about this whole thing. I think this is going to be um, fantastic for the Serenity project. And yeah, so I guess this is the end of the video. Uh, I want to thank you so much for watching, uh, if you made it here, and um, I hope you saw something interesting. And um, what do I usually say at the end of these? I guess I'll see you next time. <laughs> I guess I'll see you next time. Bye.